Hello and welcome to the Freakish Lemon video podcast. I am your host, the Freakish Lemon. I go by Adrian. I use masculine pronouns. Welcome to any new viewers. Thank you so much for clicking on whatever you clicked on to get here. And welcome back any returning viewers. Thank you so much for following along with this thing that I do. This is a crafty type podcast coming to you from the northwest hills of Connecticut and show notes for this episode and all episodes can be found at freakishlemon.com or freakishlemonpodcast.com. They go to the same place. There's a group on Ravelry. Just search Freakish Lemon in the groups tab and you will find us. And you can follow me at all the fun places as Freakish Lemon, like Twitter, Tumblr, Instagram, and Ravelry. If I'm there, I am there as Freakish Lemon. And links to all these things will be in the down bar here on YouTube or around here if you're watching this somewhere else. And if you are here on YouTube, please remember to hit that subscribe button if you'd like to follow along with what I'm doing and, you know be aware of when I post new videos. Um, yes, intro complete. Yes, my hair is still wet, but we're just gonna roll with it because it's gonna take forever to dry because it's not deathly hot out today, which is very exciting. <laughs> so exciting. It like rained last night and the temperatures just went down to a reasonable level. It's probably a higher temperature than what I think, but because it's been so hot for so much of this summer, it feels amazing right now, which is why I'm not going to wait for this mess to dry. We're going to have to deal with it, which means it'll probably get stuck to my face and I'll do this and it'll get stuck the wrong way. We're, we're just going to ignore it. See? See? Look at that. We're going to ignore it because it's too nice not to be filming and I actually got my act together and I'm filming this in the morning on Saturday, so awesome. So we start this podcast out with a little bit of podcast stuff. 2018 blanket make along still going strong. If you're making a blanket, come over to the Ravelry group and share a picture of it in that thread. Just share what you're doing, ask questions if you need help, if you need second opinions on something, come on over. Doesn't matter what craft, doesn't matter at what stage of completion the blanket is, we're just encouraging work on blankets because they take a million years. And speaking of blankets, we are in the last month of the half, half square triangle quilt along. Uh, rules are all in that thread, but it ends at the end of September basically working on a quilt that has um, half square triangles featured as part of the design um, and I'll talk more about my quilt later but feel free to come along and check that out there's been some finished quilts posted in there and they look really awesome so we're gonna start out this podcast with finished objects and I have a lot of them this episode uh, because of, I had a, a, a spinning plying party, so the, at, I think I've got it, yep, yeah, at the end of this segment I'll talk about all the hand spun that's finished, but we'll get there. So first we're going to start out with two sewing finished objects. Uh, this, it, they're gray tank tops. Super exciting, right? Look. It's a tank top. That's finished. <laughs> I have a lot of things to say about it, but it's not all that interesting to look at since it's a gray jersey tank top. Uh, and I made two of them. So let me talk about this first one. Um, this is the pattern Lago Tank by Itch to Stitch that I got free from Craftsy. It's technically a women's pattern, but for a tank top, the only difference between a women's pattern and a men's pattern is a smidge of waist shaping and maybe the size of the armholes, which is not enough for me to care. So um, I measured a t-shirt to get the finished size that I wanted, um, which uh, for me put me at a size 16 top. I think this went up to like a... I don't remember. They're all nonsense sizes anyway, completely arbitrary numbers. So I went by finished garment measurements. 
because I don't know. Um, this one I made to the pattern exactly. So there's a front piece, a back piece, and then two armhole pieces and a neckline piece. Um, it's very comfortable. The only thing about this one that's a little meh is the neckline is lower than I had anticipated, but meh. Yeah. Um, and this was made using an old Jersey cotton sheet. Um, when I had the old bed in here, the twin size bed, I did have a set of Jersey cotton sheets, uh, that I, I probably had them for 12 years. Um, <laughs> so they're well worn and too worn to be donated. So I cut them up into pieces and this is the first garment I've made using Jersey cotton. It's not the best. You can tell I've got some tucks in here. Um, my top stitching is not entirely straight. But it's not bad. I did have a problem with my walking foot where the fabric would get stuck under the back. I may have busted a spring in there somewhere, so I gotta look at it, possibly get another walking foot. It's had some heavy use over the years. But um, yeah, overall, happy with it. And so happy with it that I made a second one and there was a couple of changes that I made on this second one. Uh, the first is that each of the front and back pieces are actually two pieces. You can see a center seam there and a center seam there, which is handily only visible from the inside, which is pretty cool. Oh, backwards. Um, and that's because I didn't really care about how I was cutting up the sheet. And a sheet is much wider than a normal piece of fabric, so I was just not conscientious about where I was cutting pieces. Um, and I was also avoiding holes in the sheets. So um, so the, the front and back had to be half and halved. I raised up the neckline by about two inches, um, and just kind of freehanded the curve. And I also took the armhole and neckline pieces and used them as kind of a facing instead of a band, um, which worked out pretty good. It's a, the, it gives it more structure, um, but either way, the, like, I don't have a preference one way over the other. Um, since it's really just kind of the same number of steps and same level of difficulty using narrow pieces like that that want to curl. Uh, but I'm very happy with these tank tops and I've been living in them since it's been <sighs> so hot this summer. So that's two finished gray tank tops made out of an old sheet. Oh, my show notes went to sleep. Come back. Was there anything else that I needed to say? Nope, that was it. So, two sewing finished objects, which means that my garment sewing ideas have been firing off like crazy. I've got three patterns that I want to make multiples of. So... I gotta finish some quilts so I can free up the sewing machine to make some garments. Um, but that's the only sewing finished object that I have um, this episode. I do have one knitting finished object, uh, which I did show on the last episode as a work in progress, but it was nearly complete, and that is my machine knit Slytherin scarf. It's so amazing. Okay. So... When you last saw it, it was a big wide stockinette rectangle with waist yarn in it because I had run out of yarn. I'd gotten more yarn in, I finished it off, um, and then scrapped off uh, the top. And what I did to finish off these edges before I seamed up the side is I flipped it inside out 
and then I basically Kitchener stitched the open loops kind of around the waist yarn. Um, basically the w wrong way around. So there's this nice, easy um, pearl bump edge on the edge so that it wouldn't shift around while I was seaming it up. Like you can easily tell where that fold should be. Oh, my door is creaking. Let me go close that all the way so it doesn't creak throughout this whole thing. Okay, so I was saying that I kitchenered it inside out so that you had a row of pearl bumps so you can tell exactly where that fold should, that fold should be. And then I mattress stitched all the way along this entire scarf, um, which probably took the same amount of time as knitting the scarf, because um, machine knitting is very strange like that. Both um, ends were closed before I did the mattress stitching this way. It would be easy to tell once I got to the other end if I needed to make adjustments in the mattress stitching so that one side was not stitched more than the other. Um, yeah. And then for a lot of those ends, I just kind of like knotted them and scooted the... Uh, the knot into the inside of this because this is all open um, and I figure over time and wear they'll probably just felt together in there. It's the best thing about doing basically a tube scarf is all the ends can be on the inside. So this is my finished Slytherin scarf. Um, if you didn't see last episode this was knit on my Silver Reed LK150, which is a plastic flatbed knitting machine. Um, this is using Knit Picks Wool of the Andes Sport in Aurora Heather for the green and Dove Heather for the gray. Silver. <laughs> and... Stockinette width. Or er, stockinette stitch, double width. I told you how I put it together. I'm so pleased with it. It looks so professional. And took me probably a total of 10 to 11 hours, which for a scarf is uh, phenomenal. <laughs> I don't even think weaving a scarf would take that short amount of time for me. So very pleased with how this turned out. I'm so excited that I have replaced the old terrible acrylic one that I made when I first was knitting. So, huzzah! And then I have a quick little section here for finished dye projects. I debated whether or not to put this in here, but um, the episodes where I talk about dyeing things, I get a, you know a lot of feedback from folks, so I guess that's something that people are interested in. And, you know, frankly, with the the increase in independent dyers, like, every year it seems like everybody started dying. Um, yeah, I guess it's something that people want to hear about and uh, learn about, so I'll talk about a couple of finished dye projects. So I have one cotton dye project and one wool dye project. So the cotton dye project is this. I don't have a before. Oh, it looks so light here. It's not that light. It's more of a that color. But this is a sheet. It was a white sheet. I found it in my fabric stash and nobody could remember ever having purchased a white sheet. Like I went around my house like, do you have, did you ever buy this white sheet? And everybody's like, no, why would we ever buy white sheets? <laughs> I, like, we have a dog. Growing up, we had a dog and we had a couple of cats, you know? D you... And with four children, nobody would ever own white sheets in this house. So I was like, sweet. Yardage. I'm gonna dye it gray. I was aiming to dye it black, but I... I don't know whether... It's the fiber content of the sheet, which is a mystery and is probably cotton, but I don't know. Or if it's 
me having expectations of the dye powder that I have that are incorrect. Um, I used the Raven colored Procyon dye. Um, I'm pretty sure that's supposed to be black or incredibly dark gray, but it gave me kind of this light gray color. Again, I don't know if that was based on it's off because of the fiber content of the sheet or if I didn't put enough soda ash in the fixative bath or what, but I have this gray, which I'm not mad about. I do use gray and I can probably use this to back one of my small Halloween quilts, which would look uh, pretty neat. Um, especially if I did the quilting with black thread on the back, so it would do kind of interesting things on the back. But yeah, great way to use up an old sheet that nobody remembers ever buying. Um, and that's all the dyeing I've done with cotton dyes um, since last episode. I have also done some wool dyeing, which I have done before, and I have a couple of great resources as Gabby from Once Upon a Corgi is my sister, and my mom, Mama Gergs of Little Elephant Yarns, uh, has been doing yarn dyeing, uh, which is why I could do this uh, wool dyeing thing, because she has dyes and equipment, and I don't have to invest anything unless she needs me to replace something that I've used up. but. She had uh, a pretty near full container of extreme blue in the um, jacquard dyes, I think. Or was it the Dharma? I don't know. The color was extreme blue. She told me to use that blue because the other blue was running low. She had plenty of it. That's fine. I had several um, bits of fiber that I found in my stash to make Rolags and Bats with that were just colors that I didn't need or wasn't going to use. So one of them was these two bits of, you can still see some of the original color here, kind of this like camo green, um, over dyed it with blue. This group was not very well covered. Um, because I, I did kind of tie it loosely to keep it from separating, but I think I should have split it into more pieces um, since this was kind of, these this was from a set of mill ends that I bought. It was just miscellaneous mill ends and some of them were a little bit felty, so I ran them through my drum carter ages ago. So they're kind of mini bats. And I could have done a better job of uh, getting coverage on this, but I figure I'll just blend these on the drum carter again and kind of disperse the dark and the light colors together and um, get a more balanced bit of fiber. I also found this braid of fiber. It didn't have a tag on it. I probably got it out of somebody's D stash or Gabby might have given it to me. I don't know. Um, but it was yellow and like a lime green and like a mid-tone purple, which wasn't rocking it for me. And the color repeats in the fiber were so short that it wouldn't have made sense to try to separate out the colors to use individually. So I just over dyed the whole thing blue since yellow, green, and purple are all good colors that go with blue. Because you make a bright green, you make a, like a turquoise, you make a purplish blue. And they all go together. So that's what that looks like. So that's definitely a success. And then I also had this Merino sliver. I don't remember where I bought it from, but it's, it was, not the kind of creamy white merino that you're used to seeing. Um, it was much more of a dingy beige color and it has a lot of vegetable matter in it. So I was never using it because it wasn't 
a color that really went with anything and trying to pick the veg matter out would have been a pain to just get plain beigey color into something. So I dyed it blue. Um, I, I still have to pick veg matter out of it when I use it, but it's for a color worth using now <laughs> instead of a dingy, just gross looking, like it looked dirty. So I, I don't know. Um, like I said, I don't know where I bought it from. It was labeled with a post-it note. So now I have a whole bunch of varying blue fibers to use for making bats and Rolex, which I'm going to talk about now because I've made some Rolex. So basically this came about because I was going through the things in my craft room as you do. Like, why is this taking up space? Why haven't I done anything with this? I have one of those big, big plastic totes and two 16 quart plastic totes, which are like the smaller, like shelf sized ones. You could fit them in here. Um, just full of fiber and odds and ends to make bats and roll eggs with. I had at one point dreamed of selling mixed bats and roll eggs. Um, and for a time there was some stuff up in my Etsy shop, but it's become pretty clear to me um, that it's not really some, starting a like legitimate real business is not really something that's in the cards for me right now and probably will be, will not be anytime in the near future. Um, so, I was going through the bin and just kind of evaluating the fibers that I had. There was stuff in there that I don't know why it was in there to be blended up with stuff. I found a gorgeous uh, Greenwood Fiber Arts, I think it was, braid that was in there. I was like, why is this here? I'm just gonna spin that. Um, I found a bunch of fiber that I remember buying from the New England Fiber Festival from various farms and they were all in a bag together and they all went together. I was like, why am I gonna blend these? It was like a, like a dusky purple and a burnt orange and a like dark blue, like they all went like a, a dark red. They all went really well together. I'm like, I could do a, like a color work sweater out of this. Why is that in there to blend? Just spin it. Um, and I'm sure my tastes have changed a lot since I purposefully bought things for that bin. Um, but I figured I'd go through it, remove anything that I, I just want to spin and just start making Rolex and bats that I want to spin since I have the tools to do it and I have fiber that I've already paid for. I might as well get something out of it. And it's good practice for if I ever do want to start a business or contribute to a business that sells mixed blended, you know, roll legs and bats. So I have two bags here because I've separated them out by like related ones. So this bag is really what started me on this blue dyeing thing because I was going through all my bits and bobs, the Angelina, the silk, the like add-ins that you put in there for texture. And I have a lot of stuff that would go great in like blue. <laughs> I didn't have any blue, but I did find a bunch of stuff that went together in this kind of minty green. I had some millens that were minty green. I had some white Cormo in there. There's some green Angelina. There's, I don't know, bits and bobs. Some of the stuff's not labeled. Some of it's stuff that I got from other people. They sent it to me in swap packages or whatever years ago. So these ones are pretty fluffy and fat, but these ones really, cause there, there was a bunch of stuff that could have gone with this, but was too dark 
or would be a really extreme contrast in there. So I was like, I need some blue. I just need some blue. And I don't want to buy blue fiber for the sake of buying blue fiber because then I'll find myself in the same situation with a whole bunch of fiber that I don't know what to do with and then I pack it away for years until I decide to do something with it. So that's a little bag of like minty ones. And then these ones were all put together to kind of go with some Sith and Spin bats that I'd spun for myself a few years ago, which had a lot of black and red and like yellow, like yellow eyes of the evil Sith type um, <laughs> colors in them. So here's a kind of gradient black to red. I've got a bunch of these. These are probably the neatest ones that I pulled off the, the blending board. I've got these yellow and red ones that have a bunch of sparkle in there. I've got like red sparkle and I think I also have some copper sparkle in these ones. And then I have these kind of sunny yellow ones with um, milk silk and mohair and cormo and all sorts of fun stuff. So I'm definitely going to be making more Rolags. Um, I'll probably make some bats as well, but Rolags are really kind of easy to store. You can fit a bunch of them in a small space since everything's all compressed. Um, but if you guys are interested in seeing more of those things that I make, I'll add them to the podcast. Just let me know. Uh, if not, I'll just probably keep posting them on Instagram. Um, but yeah, I'm having a lot of fun with that, especially Rolex, because I've had trouble doing Rolex in the past, but I think I've figured out my technique where I'm not going to hurt myself making them. Um, <laughs> um, but I do want to make some bats on the drum carter. It's just that when I do that, I kind of take over the whole entire craft room so I can have everything spread out so I can see all the colors. And um, I'm trying to finish some other things that also take up a lot of room. So I'm sure I'll have some for the next podcast if you guys want to see them. But Probably not as many as that, because I, I did have a full weekend, or that's just all I did. And we're coming up on yarn festival season, so might not have a full weekend to do that kind of thing. Now that brings me to my parade of finished hand spun. It's a lot. Please remember that this is basically all of the spinning that I've done over the past year and a half, probably, um, because I was just filling up bobbins and leaving them until I filled up all the bobbins. The only spinning that's not a part of this um, is that basically travel spinning that I've done with the um, Turtle Mate Drop Spindle out of um, the orange and green fiber that's kind of blending into ugly colors. But this is basically everything spinning that I've worked on in the past year and a half, which is why there's so much of it. So first thing I finished was this alpaca uh, hand spun in this um, kind of tawny brown color. Um, this fiber is from Alpaca Obsession, which is um, kind of a localish alpaca farm. And uh, this was two ply on drop spindles. I plied it on my Blackfoot spindle, which I actually really liked. I don't really like drafting and spinning on my Blackfoot spindle, which is a spindle you kind of lean or hand just turn in your hands. You either lean it on your leg and use it or turn it in your hands. It's not like a drop. It's not a supported upright spindle. Um, I find drafting off the tip of that really hard, but for plying it was brilliant because it's bigger than most of my other spindles. In fact, it's bigger than all of my other spindles. So, you know, holding two ounces, or maybe this is four ounces, I don't know. Um, 
but it'll hold a lot more hand spun than any of my drop spindles. So that was pretty awesome. And then here's the Parade of Classy Squid Fiber Company bats. This is from the All the Mirrors of the World bat. It's a two-ply. I spun the singles on my hitchhiker wheel and I plied it on my Ashford Kiwi. And Amanda from Classy Squid Fiber Company makes the most amazing mixed bats ever. Like, she's the one who inspired me to get a drum carter and a blending board and play around with making these because they're just so amazing and I love spinning them. Because um, I don't know about anybody else, but I basically just let the fibers tell me how it wants to be spun. So, you know, there's thick, there's thin, it just, it does what it wants. I'm not fighting it, so it's really, really incredible and makes amazing textures when you knit it up. Um, so, there's that. And then a while back I got an intergalactic um, spinning kit which included a black and green mixed bat and then a bunch of little different fiber samples like there was um, I'm blanking on what any of those fiber samples were but there was some um, synthetic fibers there were some natural fibers, but they were all in different colors um, to represent um, different planets. And so I did what I think a lot of people do is I spun the bat as one ply and all the little samples as another ply. And this is like a Lisa Frank explosion uh, of color. It's pretty great. Um, I'm really happy with how this turned out. And it was really interesting just as a spinner spinning different types of fibers in that um in that one ply like which ones could be spun woolen spun which ones had to be spun worsted otherwise you'd just get a really thick blob but super fun to spin and it looks amazing and then basically last, now two weekends ago, I finished plying this Classy Squid Fiber Company um, Starfishing Mega Bat. Because um, she, at some point in the past couple of years, got a, a big drum carter and could do like five ounce bats on it. So this is one of those bats. Let me block my face so you can see. This one's getting blown out. It's not this light, it's darker. Like this is true to color here, back here. But again, incredible textures. I love her bats. I love spinning her bats so much. And then the last, nope, second to last, the last uh, fiber that I bought that's died. I keep forgetting about the last one. I don't know why, because I'm super excited about it. But this is, um, this is from Skirted Fleece Mill. It was an eight ounce braid, um, that was split into, was it eight ounces? Yeah. Um, split into three lengths of fiber that were two and some change ounces um and it was dyed as a watermelon gradient so the pinky red down through like the pale rind into a dark green i spun it three ply fractal spinning so one ply was just as was the other was split into three lengthwise and then the last one was split into six lengthwise so maximum barber polling. 
because I can never spin gradients where the colors line up. That's too much fussiness for me. I just want to ply it when it's ply time. Um, oh, I didn't say on any of the <laughs> Classy Squid ones, but the singles were either spun on the um, Hitchhiker or the Ashford Kiwi. They were all plied on the Ashford Kiwi because I have the jumbo bobbin attachment for that. Um, so this was super fun to do. And then the last that I keep forgetting, but I shouldn't, is the last of the mystery fleece. The last of it. Finally. I bought this fle these fleeces like four years ago now. Three years ago? Four years ago? A long time ago now. Um... If you don't know the mystery fleece story, because it's been a while since I talked about it. Um, was it three years ago? I don't know. It was around the time when Gabby started dyeing yarn. So that's when we really went crazy. And I started looking for cheap fleeces to learn how to process a fleece on. Um, and I saw an ad on Craigslist from a local farmer, like the next town over local, um, who just keeps sheep because she loves sheep. She had dreams of weaving rugs at one point in her life, but never got around to it. So she sheared these sheep and kept the fleeces. Um, and she was just looking to offload fleeces. So I went up to her farm. Um, I've said it before on the podcast, and I know others have said it for farmers who don't raise sheep and know how to treat the fleeces after they shear them that they they've done a common thing which is to basically stuff it in a bag and throw it in a barn loft um but she basically just wanted it out of her barn so i grabbed a basically a feed bag which had two fleeces in it which i didn't know at the time and paid her 10 bucks and took that home and i've been spinning it ever since um approximately one fleece of it i did spin in a big chunky super chunky yarn and this fleet this fleece or approximate fleece i decided to practice my long draw spinning which is when you kind of hold it loosely in one hand and just kind of let the twist travel up without really um, manipulating it too much with your fingers. Um, so I've got a lot of it. I may kind of enlist my sister Gabby to uh, dye these for me um, because it's fall colorway time and there's some fall colorways that I want but I don't I, I feel like I shouldn't necessarily be buying yarn just to have the colorways, but um, there is a colorway of hers that she, um, that I have talked to her about maybe doing a sweater's quantity of before, but maybe I can get her just to dye this. <laughs> and that's the best of both worlds. But I, I will talk to her about that. This is not the place to do it, but this may come back dyed at some point. But I'm so pleased to be finally done with the mystery fleece. I now have to find projects for it, but I'm pretty sure I've got a sweater's worth of this here. Um, and if not, you can always match bands, cuffs, all that stuff. Stripe it with something. I don't know. But I'm done with it, and that feels really good. <laughs> And that means I've got empty bobbins uh, now for both spinning wheels. The only bobbins that still have something on them are two bobbins of the brown Cormo that I'm slowly making my way through for a brown Cormo sweater spin. Um, it just gets really boring, spinning brown. And it's a worsted spin, so it's, it's pinching out the air as opposed to this, which took me a lot less time because I was just letting the twist do the work, uh, which meant it kind of went by faster than worsted spun. Ugh. But that's a lot of spinning to a finish in a couple of weeks. Um, 
but like I said, it's singles I've been working on for the past year and a half. Which brings us on to works in progress. So first work in progress is my granny stripe blanket. Um, this is using the pattern by Lucy of Attic 24. I'm using a size G hook, a 4.2 millimeter hook, and I'm marling mini skeins slash leftovers and black knit pick stroll fingering since that's cheap and easy and consistent for a big project like this. And I have made progress. That little iced bun progress keeper is where I was last episode. I've just about, oh no, I've more than doubled the height of this blanket. Huzzah. I'm nearly finished with um, the Legacy Fiber Arts half mini skeins um, advent thing from the first year that they did it. Uh, my sister and I split it, so these are half mini skeins. Uh, which shows you kind of how far mini skeins can go because you get like two and a third rows crochet which uses up one and a half times the yarn as knitting um and that's pretty awesome so this magic ball is nearly done which means i will soon be able to go on to this magic ball which also has some Legacy Fiber Arts um, yarns on it, so it'll be an easy transition into other scraps and minis. I've also been making a lot of progress on my Marled Magic Shawl, which is a pattern by Stephen West. Um, many people are aware of his designs and therefore will not be or will be familiar with this particular pattern. Let me find the front. <laughs> Again, I've made considerable progress because this is really the only hand knitting project I've been working on. So last time I spoke to you, my little plate of Halloween cookies from Sucre Sucre Miniatures was over there and I finished off this section I finished this kind of triangular section, which is blowing out. It's this color. <laughs> Back here is where the light's correct. And I just yesterday finished this triangle section. There's another section that will continue out from here for the other point of the shawl. I will be doing the larger shawl, so there's a couple more wedges that I'll be doing or something. I gotta go check the pattern. Um, and then it'll be I-cord bind off until the end of time for the entire border of this shawl. Um, if you are unfamiliar with my version of this shawl, this shawl is made using marled commercial yarns and it just came off the end of this stitch holder commercial yarns and old hand spun the newest hand spun on here is this but this green is some of my very first hand spun the kind of blacks in here and over here weren't originally black there was some really ugly beginner hand spun um there's like a semi gradient hand spun here that I didn't know what else to do with. Um, lots of hand spun, which I think is a great way to use up your old hand spun. Marl it with something, do a Stephen West pattern. You don't always need large amounts of things. So honestly, if I wasn't using hand spun, I probably would never have made this pattern. But the fact that it lends itself greatly to odd bits of hand spun brilliant. So that's that. This is being knit on size six, four millimeter needles. Um, they're Chiaogu interchangeables, so I can use like all the cords to hold all the stitches. And it's in my Avengers bag that I made for myself.
Oh, I forgot to mention the bag on my granny stripe. This is the Sheep and Shawl Yarn Shop five year birthday tote bag, um, which is a great tote bag for projects. It's, as you can see, it's like a deep tote bag. So like this red is the width of the tote bag, which is great for blankets. You don't necessarily need a tall tote bag or a wide tote bag for blankets. You really kind of need a deep tote bag for blankets and it's perfect. What else am I knitting on? I have a machine knitting project in progress. If I can unhook it from this studio light. There we go. I kind of hold the pieces in this Aaron Lane bag. Um, uh, it's Star Wars. The Force Awakens sheeples. And this is a sweater blank sweater. The sweater blank by Renee Callahan, which is a really great beginner machine knitting sweater pattern, which I love. And this is my third sweater blank sweater. Um, and I finished the back piece. So let me tell you about this sweater. This is being knit on my brother 836E knitting machine with the KR900 ribber attachment, which is basically a second bed for the machine. So I've done the ribbing for the waistbands, Here's the other one. And the two sleeve cuffs just kind of on their own scrapped off with waste yarn. Which is why there's 50,000 strings and ends. Uh, these were done with a dial tension of seven because the ribbing on the machine, because of how it goes, is going to be bigger than your stock in it. Um, equivalent on the single bed and I was having tons of problems with the river attachment. Part of it was I didn't have it adjusted correctly so at some point I just basically took the whole thing off, readjusted it, tightened some bolts, loosened some things, moved it around, put it back on, worked much better, but I also completely underestimated how much weight you need on ribbing because of how it hangs. So these pieces took me a million years to get done. And uh, actually the waistband on here, you can see there's kind of ends over here. There was a big loop for no reason on one of the stitches. So I just kind of sewed that in. I wasn't gonna re-knit that piece after all that trouble. Waited a couple weeks and then cast on for the sleeve cuffs, which I had a harder time balancing the cast on combs on because they're smaller. But I just put the heaviest weights on these and this is like 64 stitches. Not a problem. Just perfect from start to finish. So I have a much better understanding of how to use the ribber now. So that's good. But I really do like instead of knitting a cast on and doing the cuff and then transferring it onto the main bed and finishing the piece, I really do like the versatility of just doing all the ribbing at once, dropping the ribber bed, and then doing all the stockinette pieces at once. Which if you're not a machine knitter, probably sounds incredibly complicated and confusing. And as a machine knitter, you know it can be, but it's a lot of fun to learn to play. So this is my finished back piece. Per the pattern, you scrap off the top so you can just basically three needle bind off the shoulders. But the first color is this Grinning Gargoyles Khaleesi Sock in Shiny Penny. This is a stash that I bought at Stitches Midwest, which was several years ago now. So I knit the cuff on the river, or with the river, and then I 
hung that waistband onto the main bed of the machine after I finished all those pieces to pick up the stitches. Knit a bunch in, I say knit a bunch. I did do all the calculations and measurements and things out, but I did some short row shaping here um, to kind of drop the back down a little bit. Um, because I've had, I have noticed with this particular pattern that the back, when it's on my body, the back is shorter than the front if I just do the pattern as is. So I added some short row shaping to kind of curve that bottom edge. And then I switched over to some nitpick stroll fingering in black, which is kind of my go-to supplemental yarn these days. Like I said before, it's consistent and it's cheap and it's easy to get. This used 100 grams of black. I don't know how much of the copper penny. Um, well, nearly 100 grams. There is some left of that second ball, but not enough that I want to start another sweater piece on it because I'll be nervously checking it every row to make sure I have enough for the next row. So that is where I'm at with that. So the next stage is to go ahead and um, pick up the stitch. Oh. I forgot to say. I put the other end of the open stitches, because it's open on both sides, onto a size 1 2.25 millimeter Chiaogu needle and did a surprisingly stretchy bind off for the um, live bottom edge. It's not the best because it's been a long time since I used that bind off, but it's the back of the bottom of a sweater. Nobody's gonna care. I will probably improve with time. As I do the other pieces. And then most of the ends on this have been woven in. Most of them. So that's exciting. I am using the adjustment on this that I did on the last sweater, which is I'm doing the size large for all the pieces, but I'm using the measurements for the medium neckline so it's closer to this kind of crew neck and not here. Um, since this is more of like a shirt sweater than the other sweater. And that's very exciting. And then I have two weaving projects that are in progress and I'll put video up here to show you since it's harder to cart them into the room. Uh, the first is the yardage for my handwoven pants project um, using a whole bunch of stash. Um, it's on my Ashford 24 inch loom using a 12 dent heddle for fingering weight yarns. I'm doing just a plain weave and when I have the bobbins full or the little paper quills full of yarn I fly through that thing and then I just run out of yarn and I <laughs> it takes me a few days to refill all those quills. Um, I do refill them using a drill uh, with a drill bit in it that fits into the not a drill bit but it's a, a hex bit that fits into the end of the paper quills and I use a power drill to <laughs> wind the yarn on, but it's still kind of a pain. So at some point I may purchase more of those paper quills since they're super cheap and just have a bunch of them filled up, like 30 of them filled up for these longer yardage projects so I don't keep having to stop. Um, I mean, I should be stopping to take breaks, but I I don't keep having days where I don't work on it because I don't want to spend the time filling up the paper quills for the bow shuttle. And then the other weaving project is some tablet weaving on a band that I'm working on. Um, it's adapted from a chart in Candace Crockett's um, card weaving book. It's using the Nasli Gelin Garden 3 uh, crochet cotton in black, red, yellow, and white on a tablet weaving loom from Chuck Jones on Etsy. And that's going along. I had been hoping to finish it for this weekend so I could wear it kind of as an additional belt on my Renaissance Fair costume, but it's not done, so that's not gonna happen. But one day it probably will be an additional belt on my Renaissance Fair costume.
and then my half square triangle quilt. I have made considerable progress on this quilt uh, because I actually was able to clear off the dining room table to baste the quilt. So the quilt has been basted and I spent basically all of Labor Day weekend quilting the main body of the quilt. So here it is. All of the half square triangles have been quilted. Um, I did use my free motion foot on my sewing machine uh, since I've been doing a lot of free motion quilting practice and you can only get better if you keep practicing. So I decided to, and while I was fighting with my walking foot, I was just gonna do free motion quilting. So in one column of the colored pieces, I did just kind of meander squiggles. And in the other column, I did kind of loop-de-loop -loop squiggles. And in the white and off-white, I did these kind of curvy, kind of squash blossom shapes. Most of them are terrible. Um, I won't point them out. They're all done in this yellow thread uh, on the front, um, since it's a color that went with many of the colorful squares and would be visible, but not too contrasty in the white. Like from far away, you can barely tell on camera. You can see it in person a lot more, which uh, kind of lends to the squash blossom kind of effect. But you can see there's some really bad lines in those. Um, just cause I was learning how to do continuous curves over basically the height of two blocks. Um, but I learned a lot from doing this and I'm pretty pleased with it. I mean, there's definitely points where I look at it and I'm like, whoo, that was bad, but that's how you learn. Um, so that's what that looks like on the right side. And on the wrong side, if I can open this quilt, it looks pretty good. I used a white for the bobbin thread which blends in pretty nicely to this gray bed sheet and contrasts pretty nicely to this um to this reddish orange and you can kind of see from this the the shapes of the kind of arrow parts which looks really cool on the back Probably looks better on the back than it does on the front, but that's all right. I'm still fairly new to the quilting portion of quilting. Um, when I next sit down to quilt, I'm going to do in the kind of red-orange here, uh, red threads on the top and then white threads on the back throughout. And I'm just gonna do um, I think they're called infinity loops, where you kind of do kind of figure eights like that. That's nice and descriptive, right? Kind of figure eights slanting downwards and traveling. Um, and then I don't know what I'm gonna do for the blue. Uh, I'm gonna use blue thread and white thread on the bobbin. Um, but I don't know whether I'm just going to do an all over meander or try to do like a leaf meander or something fancier. I'll figure it out when I get there. Um, but that's nearly done. Probably just need another day or two devoted to quilting. And then I can trim the edges and figure out what I'm going to do for the binding. So there's hope, if I don't lose steam on this, uh, that I'll finish it before the end of my own quilt along which would be great. And then one more thing that I've been working on pretty consistently, just toss that quilt over there, um, since last episode is my Star Wars Orabesh cross stitch sampler. Cause I pulled it out one day to work on it and I saw how close I was to finishing it, which has really motivated me to work on it. So when I pulled it out, it's out of its frame for right now, but when I pulled it out, I was in this corner. And everything from here over 
had already been done. So I basically just kind of did the uh, this edge. I'm working my way down. So I am very excited about this. It's all sorts of distorted because of the way I've had it in the hoop, but it's got the full alphabet in Orabesh and um, sorry, nose itches and our alphabet, the English alphabet. There is an actual name for that alphabet and I can't recall it at the moment. And then the specialty characters down here where my thumb is um, for the combined letter sounds and then the numbers and then this bit down at the bottom here that I haven't finished all the lettering on. It says a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. And this side has the rebel symbol. This side will have the imperial cog. And we'll have some more TIE fighters in the bottom there. And I'm super excited to have this done. Super excited. Because I've got more Star Wars cross-stitch that I want to do. And I sensibly did not do all of them at the same time. Um, probably after this one, I'll do a really easy one. I do have one for the Jedi Order kind of starboard, um, symbol that I want to do, which I think is just one color, um, which would be on black fabric. And then I have a kind of, <laughs> I have one that's, that's, um, of the skyline of Moss Eisley and says, bless this wretched hive of scum and villainy. <laughs> oh, good times. Uh, that's a pattern by Ad Leones, which is a shop that was on a hiatus for a long time. I don't know if they still are or if they're still doing things, but um, I am loving that sampler and I can't wait until it's done. I can't wait to do finishing work on it since cross stitch finishing is kind of super fun to do if you're <laughs> if you're not too picky about how it turns out which I'm not I know I'll never get anything perfect so that's it for the craft stuff I've done no new swatches but I'm about to swatch for a new sweater with yarn that I bought from Rhinebeck last year I'm gonna see if I can finish it in time for Rhinebeck I don't know if we'll be able to wear sweaters at Rhinebeck because it's been pretty hot the past two years, um, but it would be a great jacket sweater. So stay tuned for that. So we'll move on to other stuff real quick. Stuff that I am watching. There's a series on Netflix that came up in Stuff You Might Want to Watch, uh, which was completely on point, thanks Netflix, uh, called Extraordinary Tales. It's animated retellings of Edgar Allan Poe stories, and it's super great. The first one is narrated by Christopher Lee, which, of course, um, one of them is, um, I think it's the Telltale Heart, is actually a recording that Bella Lugosi did, and it's animated over his recording. It's super great. Uh, totally check it out if you're into creative animation and Edgar Allan Poe. And also, I've started casually watching uh, Charmed, the TV show from the 90s, which is not one that I ever got into at the time because it was mostly airing in that period of my life where I was devouring every book that I could get my hands on, but also I didn't necessarily understand television schedules. <laughs> like, I could understand them for a couple of weeks, but then something would change and I'd be like, I don't understand how TV works anymore. I'm gonna go read a book. So <laughs> I've been casually watching that um, as something to just have on while I'm crafting. Um, and it's full of some great 90s witchy goodness. Stuff I am listening to. A whole lot of podcasts. Um, and a couple of audiobooks. So let's run through the podcasts. Uh, we'll do it 
short style where I just give a brief blurb about what the podcast is about so I don't take up all of your time. So I started listening to a podcast called Sayer. It's a sci-fi horror podcast, like a darker version of Portal. And Portal's pretty dark. It's, there's some uh, body horror in this podcast. It takes place in a space station kind of research facility. Uh, Point Mystic, which is a documentary style fiction podcast about a strange town with strange happenings, kind of X-Files, but as a documentary type thing. Um, Wormwood, which is a fiction audio drama podcast about a supernatural murder mystery in the small town of Wormwood. Um, that's how it starts in season one and then the world kind of expands uh, in season two, which is where I am. Uh, I think it's currently doing season three, so I'm catching up on that. Um, the Spirits Podcast. It's a podcast where two young women who are friends get drunk and talk about mythology. Um, one of whom is kind of a mythology buff who's an expert and has done study in that area. The other one has no clue what's happening and is along for the ride. Um, great podcast. And their podcast turned me on to uh, Potterless which I did post about on my Instagram. Uh, this is a podcast uh, where a guy in his mid-twenties is had never gotten into Harry Potter as a kid, um, partially because of the hype and partially because of his disappointment reading The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. It was just not his jam. Uh, so he's reading Harry Potter as an adult and he has guests on every episode who are Harry Potter fanatics and they just snark about the series. They poke fun at plot holes. He comes up with theories for how this book is gonna, how each book is going to progress, which are sometimes really great and accurate, which is hilarious, but also sometimes wildly inaccurate, which is the best thing ever. <laughs> um, so go check that out if you're a Harry Potter fan. And anyway, it's kind of rekindled my enjoyment of the books. Um, and yeah, it's it's great. Um, and then two audiobooks. I listened to Star Wars The Force Unleashed 2. The, the Force Unleashed 2. Just kind of slur that all together. Uh, by Sean Williams, uh, narrated by Jonathan Davis, because I had listened to the first one and I had some Audible credits to use, so I grabbed the second one. <laughs> um, I'm pretty sure those are loosely based, or pretty closely based, on the games The Force Unleashed and The Force Unleashed 2, uh, but I enjoyed listening to them. I think I have those games. I have not played them. And then I started listening to basically since September hit. Um, Six Women of Salem, The Untold Story of the Accused and Their Accusers in the Salem Witch Trials by Marilyn K. Roach, narrated by Kate Redding. Um, it's nonfiction, but it does have like little snippets of dramatizations of um, things that may have happened or were likely to have happened in um, these women's lives. Um, but yeah, it's an in-depth look at six of the women who were heavily involved, uh, accused and accusers, uh, in the Salem Witch Trials. I've got another sneeze kind of lingering there in my face. So forgive any weird facial expressions. Um, yeah, since it's September, which is officially, in my mind, halloween -y time, um haven't put anything up yet, except I put out my Halloween quilt. Um, mostly because my dad's working on the upstairs bathroom and it's hard to get to the closet where my decorations are. Um, but I probably won't actually pull those out for another week or two. But yeah, that's when I start really thinking about Halloween things and 
some friends and I had talked about maybe doing a trip up to Salem or doing more kind of day trips together. Um, we decided we're probably going to go camping in the spring. Um, so that'll be fun. But, um, yeah, we were talking about maybe going up to Salem and I started just thinking about the Salem witch trials and I wanted to learn some stuff or re-remember some stuff because I used to know a lot more than I do now. But that's been great listening to it. The only criticism I have is because I'm so used to the Star Wars audiobooks, which are bombastic and full of sound effects and music and <laughs> theatrical that uh, Kate Redding's reading, which is perfectly fine and is, you know, I do enjoy listening to her. It just seems so flat <laughs> because I'm so used to listening to Star Wars audiobooks. Um, things, and I'm probably so used to just listening to fiction where things are, even when they're just read aloud to you, are a little bit more theatrical in terms of dialogue and narration than a non-fiction book. So something to be aware of if you don't listen to non-fiction books a lot. Like me. <laughs> And then stuff that I am reading. I bought this book a while back when I was um, really kind of in the long haul for my hand troubles, which are thankfully pretty much non-existent at this point. Um, that hand specialist I went to actually knew what he was talking about, so that's great. Um, I generally do not have hand pain anymore uh, over the past month or so. My hands will get tired still. Um, I still can't, and I probably shouldn't get back in the habit of like knitting for three hours straight, um, but it has considerably improved as you saw from the array of finished objects and works in progress. But in the kind of midst of it, I did end up purchasing this book, Knitting Comfortably, um, The Ergonomics of Hand Knitting by Carson Dimmers. I don't know how you pronounce his last name. Um, but I have been kind of picking it up and reading it on occasion just to get some some tips and tricks now that I am routinely knitting again. Um, so that's good. I'm about halfway through it. Um, and I have changed some of the things I do. In particular, and this this is a trick that it's super easy for me to do at home. It's not as easy to do out in the world. But when I'm knitting now, generally, I'm standing at my craft table, my cutting table, which is raised up, so it's kind of... It's higher than a normal table. And I'm just resting my knitting on that so the weight of it isn't aggravating anything. I'm basically at the table, everything is supported because that's a pretty heavy shawl when I lift it out of the bag. So, like, that is a thing that helps. And I'm also standing, which is great for my posture. I'm not, like, schlumping and knitting. Um, so that's a trick that I found really helpful and is something that um, is talked about a lot in here is the posture of your spine, um, how you're holding your arms, the weight of your knitting. So good instinct there. It's nice to see, like, you know, a physical therapist actually talk about those things that I managed to figure out. So that's good. And then another book that I've been reading, well, I've basically read it. I mean, I didn't in-depth read it, but I did a first read through. And it's the Clothing from the Hands That Weave book by Anita Luvera Mayer. Um, which is a great resource if you want to get into making clothing with your weaving, which I've really been inspired to do because of uh, Grace from Babel's Traveling Yarns and just kind of making clothes in general. This book, it's not necessarily a how-to 
It's more about how to get started and why things have been done the way they have been done. So it basically starts out with like a history of how cloth was used, like the first big weaving looms, like how they did wrapped garments because it was just a lot easier to do a big piece of cloth than to cut it into tiny pieces. And she goes all over the world. So like the same piece of cloth is wrapped differently based on where you were from, India or Ethiopia or Somalia or in ancient Rome. Um, and then goes through basically the patterns in clothing types. So a poncho started out as a piece of animal skin, but if you weave it, you can do a couple of different things and the evolutions of those things. Everything is these simple line drawings so you're not distracted by color or embellishments. Like the evolution of shirt shapes and a bunch of different traditional cultural shirt shapes which broken down like this make it really easy to see how these garments are constructed. There's a bunch of caftans. And then probably the most valuable resource um, for me personally are these kind of schematics for garments using rectangles. Like this one's a shirt and it gives you the measurements. This is 14 and three quarter inches wide and it's 27 inches here, 27 inches here. Like those are your sleeves. You just do one line cut there. You weave this piece for the front and back, you cut out a hole, you just cut, like, basically giving you plans on, once you know what shapes you want, and your own measurements, how you figure out how to weave those pieces as simply as possible. Like this one, I've got bookmarked a couple of them that I want to try. This is a Greek style shirt using pieces that are eight inches wide, which you can do on a 10 inch cricket loom, which is a lot of, like a lot of people start with really small looms like that. But you can make a shirt fairly easily <laughs> once you figure out your numbers. And they just kind of, that's an incredible resource. And then like there's these pages of like, design ideas and embellishments, um, how to add things like to accommodate for hips, like if you have wide hips, how to accommodate for that, how to measure for things, how to, there's stitches for uh, joining the pieces if you're going to sew them by hand. Um, she has some examples of pieces that she's woven and embellished herself. Like, they're super cool. I mean, obviously not to everyone's taste, but... It really gives you a breakdown of the construction of these pieces. Like this one looks like something you, you could buy in a shop. So it's a really great resource to kind of get a foundation of how clothing has been made traditionally, which it's kind of easier to wrap your head around how these pieces work rather than a modern pattern where 
so many of the uh, sides of a garment are curved because of modern styles. But that's a great resource if you're interested in possibly weaving for making clothing. I've also been trying to make time to actually read my books. So I've done a little bit more reading in um, the book All Out, the No Longer Secret Stories of Queer Teens Throughout the Ages, edited by Sandra Mitchell, which is phenomenal. Um, I love it. And it's one of the books that I've been making time to read. I've also started reading um, the young adult book Turtles All the Way Down by John Green. Um, I've been following uh, the Vlogbrothers YouTube channel that he shares with his brother Hank for a long time. I've read pretty much all of his previous books. I met him at an event once when they were doing um, Vlogbrothers nerd fighter tours. Um, so my mom got me his newest book for Christmas last year. I'm just now getting around to reading it. Like once I get into the meat of it, I'll be done in a day, but sometimes I find it hard to start young adult fiction books. I, I don't know why that is, but sometimes I find it hard, to, especially if they're from the first person, and John Green always writes from the first person. It's not my favorite writing style. I much prefer, like, third person limited. Um, or third person omniscient if the narrator is snarky. The, that's, like, my jam. But, um... I'm liking it so far. I did have to put it down for a while after the first chapter because the character goes into uh, kind of a depressive thought spiral that hit a little close. So I was like, oh, let's put that away until I'm in a better place to read this. Um, but I've kind of gotten into the groove of the beginning of the story, so I think I can keep going now. And also I wanted to talk about one fanfic um, that I've finished reading, um, for you guys this episode, and it's a series called Love That Grows by Wizardheart83, um, also known as Plant Murderer, um, and it's an alternate universe fic. It's Harry Potter, and the summary for the first, um, fic in the series is, Less than a year after the death of the Potters, Rose Evans and her husband Lyle take care of their orphaned grandson Harry and try to take steps toward a future while he where he'll be loved and accepted. Spring is coming, and with it the memory of stirring warmth and the first real hope for life and growth. So in this fic, Harry's dropped off at the Dursleys, per the story, but because Petunia and Lily's parents are still alive in this story, Petunia has the sense of mind to be like, I cannot take care of this child because I have not gotten over my envy and my hatred and my jealousy of my sister. So she brings baby Harry over to her parents' house and they take him in and they love him and they invite Petunia up just to spend time with him once a month. Like, just so he knows where you are. If something happens and he has to go back, he knows who you are. And there's a really great healing process with this fic of kind of the grandparents and Harry kind of healing, you know, their grief over the death of James and Lily. And through getting to distance herself from that pain and really kind of seeing Harry for just a child, Petunia kind of starts healing from that process and her own grieving process for Lily, which I think is completely arrested in the actual book because she cannot forgive Lily 
and so she cannot grieve her properly. Um, so like as Harry's growing up, Petunia starts kind of warming up to magic. She's seeing a child who's magical through a different light, through a different lens. She starts, when she's comfortable with it, bringing Dudley over so they can play. And it's not this like horrible bullying relationship. It's just, oh, he's kind of my weird cousin. Yeah, let's go play in the dirt, you know? <laughs> and like, it kind of slowly warms Vernon up to the idea too. It becomes a less toxic relationship overall because there is this distance kind of buffered with the grandparents. Um, which is really, it's really well explored and I highly recommend it. Links to that will be in the show notes. And that's going to do it for this podcast episode. So show notes and everything are over at freakishlemon.com. If you want to go check those out, come join us in the Ravelry group. Just search Freakish Lemon in the groups tab. Come post in the 2018 blanket make along. Come check out the quilt along. If you're a super fast quilter, consider joining. <laughs> it's half square triangles. Um, or if you've got a quilt that you need to finish and it's got half square triangles in it, just finish it. Be a part of our quilt along. Um, you can follow me at all as Freakish Lemon at all the fun places like Twitter, Tumblr, Instagram, Ravelry. You know, the fun places. The links to all those things will be in the down bar here on YouTube or around here if you're watching this somewhere else. And if you are here on YouTube and you want to follow along, if you want to know when I post the next episode, uh, which is approximately monthly on this channel, uh, consider hitting that subscribe button down here on YouTube so you can, you know, know when I post something new. But it's up to you. So that is going to do it for this episode. It's probably been a long one. I always say that. I need to stop doing that. Okay. Goodbye. <laughs>